in northern Italy has killed at least 11 people and forced thousands more to evacuate their homes. A dreadful storm has just struck Italy. What occurred? Is this something related to the end times or the sign of God? In this episode, I will explain in more detail. Smash that thumbs up button for me, leave me a comment down below, and share this video with your friends. And let's get started. In the Italian sky, under the warm afternoon sunlight, a storm was brewing in the distance. Dark clouds began to roll like powerful windbreakers of nature. The first thunder sounded like the call of ancient gods, and then powerful lightning appeared. Strong winds from the storm blew through, undulating tree branches, creating ripples on the sea and moving people's hearts. Heavy rain began to fall, creating undulating and hissing sounds from water droplets on the roof. Strong winds swept away old trees, breaking weak branches. Thunder echoed in the sky like powerful blows, while lightning flashed like red sparks. The sky was pitch black, but each time the lightning flashed, it made everything clearer, but also full of terror. There is a coincidence that recently, in an area in the state of Texas, a strange sound appeared while there was lightning in the sky. There is a video recording of that incident. The incident was even more terrifying when an identical sound appeared in the sky in Italy. But what is that sound? Please watch the end of the video to see the truth behind this mystery. The fierce storm led to flooding. Roads became rushing rivers. Riverside houses were submerged in water and verdant fields turned into plump seas of water. The flood carried the power of water, washing away everything in its path. The tree branches bend under the pressure of the water, and the lush green grass disappears under the thick layer of black water.
When hail hits the Italian mainland, nothing can stop the force of nature. Cold stones fell from the sky like black diamonds, creating strange sounds and panic among all living things underground. The cold winds from the storm brought dark clouds to cover the sky, creating a gloomy and tense atmosphere. Natural disasters on land not only cause serious immediate consequences, but also have profound and lasting effects for a long time afterward. While a storm, flood, or hailstorm is going on, loss of life and property is often the top thing people have to deal with. Loss of life causes immeasurable suffering and grief, while loss of assets, such as homes, furniture, and infrastructure, can cause great economic hardship and loss. Please join us in sending prayers for Italy, where people are facing hardship and pain from sweeping storms and floods. Merciful God, we offer you our prayers for the people of Italy, who are going through difficult and sad times due to storms and floods. Please give them strength and patience every day so that they can overcome all difficulties and recover from disaster. Amen. Back to the story about the strange sound. In Texas, Amidst a tumultuous lightning storm, a man bravely decided to live stream the event, capturing something utterly perplexing. As bolts of lightning illuminated the sky, an eerie and inexplicable sound echoed through the air, seemingly triggered by each flash. The man, stunned by what he was witnessing, shared the phenomenon with his viewers in real time. The sound, akin to a haunting scream, pierced through the night, causing an array of reactions among the viewers. Some speculated wildly, attributing the phenomenon to supernatural entities such as the mythical screaming in the night goddess, or even extraterrestrial beings. Others suggested more earthly explanations, proposing the involvement of dragons or other mythical creatures. However, despite the flurry of theories, no one could definitively pinpoint the source or cause of the spine-chilling sound. As the live stream continued, the mysterious screams persisted, adding an extra layer of tension and intrigue to the already dramatic storm. The comments section flooded with speculation and disbelief as viewers grappled with the surreal experience unfolding before their eyes. In the aftermath of the live stream, the enigmatic event sparked widespread discussion and debate. News outlets picked up the story, further fueling curiosity and speculation. Yet, despite efforts to rationalize or explain away the phenomenon, the mysterious screams remained shrouded in mystery, leaving both the lives, Trema and his audience bewildered and unsettled. The incident served as a stark reminder of the vast mysteries that still exist in the world around us, reminding us that even in the midst of modernity, there are phenomena that defy explanation and continue to captivate the imagination. In the Italian sky that day, amid the chaos of lightning and the deafening roar of the storm, there emerged yet another perplexing element, a mysterious sound that seemed to defy explanation. As the thunder echoed across the landscape, this inexplicable noise added another layer of unease to an already tense situation. In the minds of some, it was as if the very fabric of reality was unraveling, signaling an impending cataclysm of apocalyptic proportions. With each bolt of lightning illuminating the darkened sky, the strange sound persisted, growing louder and more ominous with each passing moment. Speculation ran rampant among those who witnessed the phenomenon, with some attributing it to divine intervention or cosmic forces beyond human comprehension. For others, it served as a chilling reminder of ancient prophecies foretelling the end of days. The convergence of natural phenomena and supernatural speculation fueled fears of an impending apocalypse, with whispers of biblical prophecy and mythological omens circulating among the populace. Some saw the event as a harbinger of divine judgment, a warning to repent and seek redemption before it was too late. 
Others viewed it through the lens of ancient folklore, invoking tales of gods and monsters as they grappled with the inexplicable. In the wake of the event, discussions about the meaning and significance of the strange sound spread far and wide, capturing the imaginations of people around the world. It sparked debates among theologians, scientists, and conspiracy theorists alike, each offering their own interpretation of the ominous portent that had unfolded in the Italian sky. Yet, amidst the uncertainty and speculation, one thing remained clear. The mysterious sound had left an indelible mark on the collective consciousness of those who bore witness to it. Whether it was a sign of impending doom or simply a natural anomaly, its impact reverberated far beyond the confines of that stormy day, serving as a reminder of the enduring mysteries of the universe and the fragility of human existence. In addition, in the Bible, storm also has a meaning. What does the Bible say about storms? In the Bible, there are many times that God provided protection for his people from natural storms. While we still seek shelter from physical storms today, we can look to scripture for encouraging words during the symbolic storms of our life. Times of grief and despair can be represented by storms as moments to endure until the sunny days of happiness and safety arrive. The Bible provides wisdom and guidance to get through the storms of our lives and follow the path of God through difficult times. Luke 2.52 says, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This verse, found in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, verse 52, describes the growth and development of Jesus during his childhood and early years. It reads, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. This verse highlights four key aspects of Jesus' growth. Wisdom. Jesus grew not only physically, but also intellectually. He acquired knowledge, understanding, and wisdom as he matured, demonstrating his human capacity for learning and development. Stature. This refers to Jesus' physical growth and development, like any human being, he experienced the natural progression from childhood to adulthood, physically growing in size and strength. Favor with God. Jesus enjoyed a close and special relationship with God the Father. As the Son of God, he lived in perfect obedience and communion with God, receiving divine favor and approval. Favor with man. Jesus also experienced positive relationships with other people. He interacted with others in a way that earned their respect, admiration, and favor. His compassion, kindness, and teachings endeared him to many. Overall, this verse encapsulates the holistic growth of Jesus, physically, intellectually, spiritually, and socially, during his time on earth as he prepared for his ministry and eventual sacrifice for humanity. It emphasizes his humanity while also hinting at his divine nature and purpose. The storm is also a sign of God's wrath. Wrath is defined as the emotional response to perceived wrong and injustice, often translated as anger, indignation, vexation, or irritation. Both humans and God express wrath, but there is vast difference between the wrath of God and the wrath of man. God's wrath is holy and always justified. Man's is never holy and rarely justified. In the Old Testament, the wrath of God is a divine response to human sin and disobedience. Idolatry was most often the occasion for divine wrath. Psalm 78, 56, 66 describes Israel's idolatry. The wrath of God is consistently directed towards those who do not follow his will. Deuteronomy 1, 26, 46, Joshua 7, 1, Psalm 2, 1, 6. The Old Testament prophets often wrote of a day in the future, the Day of Wrath, Zephaniah 1.14, 15. God's wrath against sin and disobedience is perfectly justified because his plan for mankind is holy and perfect, just as God himself is holy and perfect. God provided a way to gain divine favor, repentance, which turns God's wrath away from the sinner. To reject that perfect plan is to reject God's love, 
mercy, grace, and favor and incur his righteous wrath. The New Testament also supports the concept of God as a God of wrath who judges sin. The story of the rich man and Lazarus speaks of the judgment of God and serious consequences for the unrepentant sinner. Luke 16:19-31. John 3:36 says, "Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him." The one who believes in the Son will not suffer God's wrath for his sin because the Son took God's wrath upon himself when he died in our place on the cross, Romans 5, 6, 11. Those who do not believe in the Son, who do not receive him as Savior, will be judged on the day of wrath, Romans 2, 5, 6. Conversely, human wrath is warned against in Romans 12, 19, Ephesians 4, 26, and Colossians 3, 8, 10. God alone is able to avenge because his vengeance is perfect and holy, whereas man's wrath is sinful, opening him up to demonic influence. For the Christian, anger and wrath are inconsistent with our new nature, which is the nature of Christ himself. 2 Corinthians 5.17 To realize freedom from the domination of wrath, the believer needs the Holy Spirit to sanctify and cleanse his heart of feelings of wrath and anger. Romans 8 shows victory over sin in the life of one who is living in the Spirit. Romans 8, 5, 8. Philippians 4, 4, 7 tells us that the mind controlled by the Spirit is filled with peace. The wrath of God is a fearsome and terrifying thing. Only those who have been covered by the blood of Christ, shed for us on the cross, can be assured that God's wrath will never fall on them. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Romans 5, 9. God will still save us if we repent. What is the definition of salvation for a Christian? A concise definition of salvation can be summed up in one word, deliverance. But deliverance from what? When the Israelites came out of Egypt and reached the Red Sea, Moses told them to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord Exodus 14.13. In this case, God provided a physical deliverance for Israel from the armies of Egypt. In the New Testament, the term salvation describes two essential components of a Christian's life. Being delivered from the penalty of sin, which is eternal death, Romans 6.23. Being delivered from mortality and given the gift of eternal life, John 3.15. Salvation is very important. The Bible calls it so great a salvation, Hebrews 2, 3. Salvation is all about how a Christian can live a better life today and ultimately live forever in the future. What are we saved from? What do we need to be saved from? To answer that question, first we go back to the time when man was created by God. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being, soul, King James Version, Genesis 2, 7. Later, the prophet Ezekiel noted that all souls, living beings, belong to God. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, is mine. The soul who sins shall die, Ezekiel 18, 4. This is repeated again in verse 20, the soul who sins shall die. Many places in the Bible, human life is described as mortal, Romans 6.12, 8.11, 2 Corinthians 4.11. All human beings face the same inevitable fate, we will die. But the doctrine of salvation shows us we can be delivered from eternal death. Every human being, except for Jesus Christ, has sinned. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. The penalty for sin is death. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23 Sin causes every person to earn the death penalty. Once we have sinned, we earn the penalty of death, and there's nothing we can do to remove that penalty ourselves. We have to be delivered from it. So man needs to be saved, 
delivered from eternal death, and to be given the gift of God, which is eternal life. That is why salvation is necessary, and why Jesus came to the earth as a human being. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19.10 We are all lost to the penalty of sin, eternal death, and the only way to be delivered from that penalty is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. How Jesus Christ is the source of our salvation. The Bible shows that God the Father and Jesus Christ love human beings immensely. They created us in their image and want to share eternal life with us. But in order for that to happen, God had to provide a way for us to be saved or delivered from sin and death. God the Father and Jesus Christ have a plan to accomplish this. Jesus Christ came to earth and lived a perfect life, not earning the penalty of death due to sin, and then gave his life for us. Because he was God in the flesh, his sacrifice can pay the penalty for all human sins. Romans 5, 8 tells us, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus gave his life, a life of perfection, without sin, so that we can be saved. It is by his shed blood that salvation is now made possible for all humans. But that doesn't mean human beings only have to accept that sacrifice and, poof, they are saved. The Bible shows we need to accept his sacrifice and also repent and turn from sin. The prophet Isaiah wrote, Seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon, Isaiah 55, 6, 7. Changing our lives is an important part of the salvation process. Obedience and salvation. Jesus was once asked a question about how to inherit eternal life, which is the end result of salvation. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Luke 10, 25, 28. Earlier, another man asked Jesus, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Matthew 19, 16, 17. The Bible is clear that salvation is a gift and it cannot be earned. Ephesians 2, 8. But that doesn't mean we can live any way we want and still be saved. We have been called to be his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, Ephesians 2.10. Keeping the commandments of God are some of the good works Jesus told us we need to do. Sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4, King James Version. Transgressions are violations of God's law and his way of life. Therefore, part of being saved from the penalty of past sin is to try our hardest to stop sinning with God's help. Our transgressions against God's law have to end. As the Apostle Paul wrote, How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Romans 6, 2. We are to leave sin and pursue a life of righteousness, which is based on God's Ten Commandments. Psalm 119, 172. Are you saved? Jesus came to die for our sins, which are actions that break God's law. He paid the penalty of death for us so that we can have eternal life. He reconciled us to God the Father, justified us of our past sins through his blood. Hence, after we repent of our sins and accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our salvation, our deliverance from eternal death is possible. But we cannot continue to break God's laws. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? 
Romans 6, 1, 2. The Apostle Paul again pointed out this principle in verse 12. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Paul then asked an important question. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness? Romans 6.16 The answer is obvious. Sin leads to death, obedience leads to righteousness, and eternal life. The Apostle Paul understood that he would receive a crown of righteousness at Jesus Christ's return. 2 Timothy 4, 8. He also understood that this promise was for more than just him, but also to all who have loved his appearing. That means receiving eternal life when the salvation process is complete. Learn more in our article, What Does It Mean to Be Saved? So to recap, what is salvation? Salvation is a process that begins when we accept Jesus Christ's sacrifice for our sins. We are saved or delivered from our past sins and their penalty, death. We must then begin a life of change and growth, becoming more like our Saviour, Jesus Christ. If we continue to repent and change and remain faithful for our whole life, we will then receive salvation in its fullest sense, be given eternal life at the return of Jesus Christ. We will be saved from ever having to face death again. God will return. It was one of the lowest points in American history. In a matter of a few short months, the Japanese had devastated the US military in the Pacific. The attack at Pearl Harbor was just the beginning. Afterward, Japan attacked the United States and other nations all throughout the Pacific Ocean. Among the many targets was the Philippines, where 90,000 American and Filipino troops tried to fight off the Japanese onslaught. These men were led by General Douglas MacArthur. He had been their commander for years, but had to be smuggled out of the country during the night to escape the Japanese invasion. He made it to Australia safely, expecting to immediately begin the fight to save his men back in the Philippines. Instead, he was told the terrible news that there was nothing he could do. The country he had left behind would fall to Japan, and his men would either die or be captured by the Japanese. Many of them would eventually become victims of the infamous Bataan Death March. Hope for the Philippines. The news distressed MacArthur, but he didn't give up hope for the country and people he had grown to love. Instead, he issued a solemn promise to those whom he had been forced to abandon. They were three simple words, but they had a powerful impact. I shall return. MacArthur lived by those words for the next two and a half years, doing everything he could to free the islands and the people he cared so much for. The words weren't just for MacArthur's sake. The Filipinos and Americans who were trapped by the Japanese and would soon fall victim to their brutality heard those words as well. I shall return. Became a rallying cry for those who were still fighting the Japanese giving them hope when it seemed that there was no hope. A greater promise. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ left the earth and assumed his place at the right hand of the Father. The world that he left was a mess, and it hasn't improved. Sometimes, in the relative prosperity of Western nations, it can seem that things are okay with the world. But an honest look around the globe reveals that nothing could be further from the truth. Our world is filled with wars, famines, disease, civil unrest, division, terrorism, and countless other evils. Just as the country MacArthur left fell captive to the Japanese, so too our world has fallen spiritually captive to sin and the suffering that results from it. 24.3 Jesus answered with many details of signs that would point to his imminent return, but he also warned his followers not to be deceived by false prophets. Verses 4, 5, 23, 27. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next video.